Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know It All. So I'm at the Uray Ice Park, which is the oldest, historically oldest ice park in the uh, in the world or in the country? In the world. And the best, according to Charlie. Charlie's my cameraman today. He's a cook climb repeat. Um, we were supposed to be climbing this stuff during my trip here, but he busted up his ankle, so we're crying about that. He's crying about it way worse than I am. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> Charlie's a sad man, so thank you for being my cameraman. Uh, I want to talk about the Apple, the new Apple uh, M1 Ultra Chip. I've got, look, it's like a kitchen check. I've got my notes on it. <laughs> we're doing this rough shot here, man. Uh, so anyway, it's the new Mac Studio, which either comes with an M1 Max or an M1 Ultra chip inside of it. And the question is, is this a really an AI training breakthrough? So also, it's the revenge of the Mac Cube. If you have not seen the Mac Cube, oh gosh, back in the 90s when Steve Jobs introduced it, he had a cube and he was just always into these cubes. So the studio looks kind of like that. It's like a squished cube. It's out of aluminum and stuff. So. You know Apple, they've got to make their designs like super, super crazy. But anyway, uh, for one thing, I'm super excited about this. And I don't know if you can see in the background, it's just FYI. Twin Peaks is up there. You can actually see the two rocks. So. <laughs> Sorry to get distracted here. I just love this spot. I wish I could move here. This is just beautiful. Um, anyway, it's the first reasonable desktop computer coming from Apple in a really long time. It's a headless desktop, so it's not like the, uh, the iMac where it has the screen integrated into it. So I'm super excited. I'm as soon as I can figure out how to afford it, gonna get one debating between the max version and the ultra version because they do cost a significant difference. Um, starts at $2,000 is the lowest end spec one. And I think, you know, probably, I didn't really spec it out completely, but probably around six grand if you wanna just like go crazy and have everything. So just for a general thing, of course, you can go to apple.com and look it up. Uh, so this is using Apple Silicon. Uh, my laptop is an M1 laptop and I absolutely love it. The only really big negative to the laptop is that it's only got 16 gigs of RAM, which means it's just always memory constrained on doing things like just running Final Cut Pro by itself to edit a lot of my videos just <laughs> crushes the memory. So anyway, so this is a whole different story though. So anyway, that's a big problem with it, but the M1, the Apple Silicon is just so, so fast. So I'm gonna go through the specs and explain why they actually matter. Number one, five nanometer technology. 114 billion transistors on the ultra version of it. So I assume that's half of that, which is 57 billion transistors for the max version. Because basically the ultra is two maxes like stuck together, which we'll talk about in a second. So five nanometer process, super, super good. Uh, 20 core CPU with four high efficiency CPUs. So if you're running it, this will matter more in a laptop configuration but if you're trying to save power and just doing basic stuff like surfing the web or something you can run off the high efficiency cpus and then it also has 16 high performance cpus so 20 cores 64 core gpu which is insane <laughs> it's just like bleh. anyway and a 32 core neural net engine that does 22 tops I, I was a little disappointed in that. I mean, it was like a 32 core neural net um, neural engine sounded really great. And then 22 tops, I was like, mm, it's not the fantastic, most fantastic um, spec in the world. It The really, really nice thing is it has a unified memory architecture like the other M1 stuff. I'm going to talk about that more in just a second. And you can do up to 128 gigabytes. So as opposed to my measly 16, you can do up to 128 gigs. And it has an 800 gigabytes per second bandwidth, which means transferring data back and forth from memory to the main um, CPU, GPU, neural net engine, etc. So, oh, and it also has hardware acceleration for audio and video. So it does a lot of stuff in the hardware. <laughs> so pretty amazing. Like I said earlier, the Ultra is two Maxes Lego together. It basically, so the Max, when they created it, they didn't tell anybody at the time, but they had kind of a, I don't know. <laughs> you can think about it metaphorically like a Lego thing, right? It had like a little extension. So you can put, plug two of those together with a bus. And as opposed to um, creating multi-core chips, like physical ones, they actually have a 2.5 terabytes per second interconnect between the chips, which is like, and also logically it appears as one chip to, um, uh, to the uh, to the you know programmer or whatever. So you don't have to do any kind of reprogramming or anything like that. Uh, and interestingly enough, they said that the Max basically the the M1 Max. So there's the M1 M1 Pro, which is bigger. The M1 Max, which is really big, and then the Ultra, which is two M1 Maxes stuck together. The M1 Max is actually 
uh, was like pushing the die size limit. So they couldn't really go much bigger than that. So they had to stick two of them together. They did say that this is the last M1 evolution. I noticed that they didn't really make a point of it, but they said last M M1. So I expect whatever the next chip is going to be, it's going to be M2 or something like that. So anyway, really interesting. So it requires the inter interconnect, but as it's one logical chip and as it has 2.5 terabytes per second, the interconnect doesn't seem to be a really big slowdown. Uh, also really cool, it does really, really high performance per watt. I've actually done a video on this before and what I've talked about the end of AI, I'll try to put a link up here if I can do that. And obviously I'm traveling right now. Uh, but anyway, it, energy is a really, really big problem with, with AI and with computers in general. So very, very cool that they're working on low power stuff and that's, that's really awesome. So they have just a massive savings per watt of performance. So that's really, really cool. Uh, so obviously for any normal use like audio, video editing, I mean, surfing the web, it would be monstrous overkill. <laughs> but whatever you want to do, programming, things like that, it's going to be an absolute beast. It should completely scream on video editing and stuff. Um, but for AI training, uh, that's the big question. The, the two main factors for AI training are number one, the fact that it's got 32 neural engine cores, that's gonna be huge. And number two, that it's got a unified memory architecture. So traditionally, you've got your CPU, you've got your memory that goes to the CPU. It's got, it's fast, but it's not fast compared to the CPU, which is why they always have like L1 and L2 caches and stuff on the CPU. And then you've got your GPU and the GPU has its own dedicated memory. So if you've got like a 16 gig NVIDIA card or something like that, Oh, that guy's getting up the map. <laughs> He's making it. He's getting there. So there you go. A little bit of eye candy while you're listening to all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, so, so the problem with that is that you have to have dedicated graphics memory, dedicated main memory. There's all sorts of bandwidth issues and how fast they can transmit data back and forth. That slows down neural network training a ton. In fact, most of neural network training like slowdowns is the memory bottleneck of fetching memory and sending memory. The calculations themselves actually go fairly quickly. So it's a really, really big deal that they've got this unified memory architecture, which gives you access to up to 128 gigabytes. Now, I mean, maybe take off like 16 gigabytes of that, uh, you know, so you're at a 112, is that right? <laughs> anyway, so you, but you've still got like over 100 gigabytes of memory that you can dedicate specifically to doing AI training if you want to do something like that. So that's really, really fa fantastic. Again, I was kind of disappointed to put this in perspective. Tesla's hardware three, there's two chips on the hardware three, and each of those is 72 tops. And so the fact that these, this ultra thing only does 22 tops seems really disappointing to me. But anyway, again, it's different when you're doing neural engine stuff versus GPU stuff. So it's possible that that 22 tops may be better than that. But again, the big bottleneck is generally the bandwidth, the memory bandwidth of passing data back and forth between memory and the um, and the, the, comp the compute cycle, so, or the compute area. Anyway, so the 22 tops may not matter as much as that. So the big thing is the efficient access to really, really large amounts of memory. That's going to be absolutely huge. And what it means is that you could have, you know, neural network models that could be 50, 60, 70 gigabytes on a personal computer. And you could have batch sizes that are really, really big too. You don't have to have small batch sizes with your data. So you can play around with this and work on it. So I expect that this is going to absolutely kill on AI training. It should be fantastic. And then the other aspect, of course, is that it's doing this all at a relatively low power envelope need. So... It should be able to handle really big data, should be able to handle really big neural network models, and it should be very cool, literally, because it should be able to run for a lot less energy than a lot of uh, other computers that are out there right now. So anyway, I'm super excited for those of us who can't afford or don't have access to something like Dojo or a supercomputer cluster. This sounds like a really amazing solution to be able to do AI. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. So anyway, I hope you're excited too. If you enjoyed the episode, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this. As always, a gigantic shout out to my patrons on Patreon. I know I've been traveling a lot, but I really do love you all. Thank you so much. I will be back home, you know, in a few more days. So anyway, traveling now. But anyway, I'm having fun. You guys have fun. Stay safe. I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Welcome to URA Colorado, y'all. We're here at the world famous URA Ice Park. It's one of the world's oldest and still to this day, the best man-made ice park in the world. 
ice farmers are employed throughout the winter to farm this ice. They run water at night, sometimes during the day, trimming off dangerous daggers, putting in hours and hours of work. The team that runs this are incredibly talented um, and definitely one of the more beloved members of the community for all the work they do. Um, and yeah. this goes on. This is only part of it, right? There's a whole other section yeah, like up the there. The canyon's about a mile and a half long. We're right here underneath the upper bridge. This is the lead only area. Um, it goes all the way down past the Scottish gullies and into the Five Fingers to the north. That area is past the competition tower and the tree that you can see in the distance. And to our south, going up, you have the schoolroom followed by the new frontier and South Park. Uh, <laughs> The new fun tier? The new fun tier. Fun tier, okay. <laughs> it's got to be named a cheesy name. You got it, right? <laughs> um, this is what put ice climbing kind of on the map and made it more accessible for the general public because you can come into this area and without facing the same dangers as backcountry ice climbing, such as avalanches and having to lead things, you can really learn, dial in your technique, um, and it's really something that's uh, probably contributed more to the sport than... Uh, just right. about anything. This is so. a pretty young sport, right? Well, the sport itself isn't young. <laughs> uh, really, you know, the the United S France kind of and the Europeans really pioneered gotcha. um, mountaineering and ice climbing techniques. But actually, the North Americans and Canadians took over hard ice climbing at a certain point. The reverse curve picks. Um, invented by, I believe, Yvonne Chouinard. I'm going to get torn apart if that's the wrong thing. But uh, gear that allowed us to climb things like these steep waterfalls. Right. Um, and the daggers, right? All and, that stuff. Uh, so North America took off, and then, of course, like always, the Europeans caught up to us and right. uh, raised the standards even further. So, and Charlie is, like, expert at this stuff. Like, he solos these, these uh, giant daggers that are pointing down and... I don't know. <laughs> you check check out his channel. It's Cook Climb Repeat. He's got excellent excellent meals and some really cool videos of him climbing crazy ice and rock too, right? Try to. That's why I live here. <laughs> Southerners on ice. Originally from Georgia, came here and never left. I was like, this is rad. I'm staying. <laughs> there you go. All right. Anything you want to say or you want to sign off and say goodbye? That's it. Peace enjoy, out. Oh, I guess this is probably going to the beginning. So enjoy uh, enjoy learning about the new Apple computer. There we go. All right.